and welcome to worship with Chimi United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Alyssa Birch, and in a few moments you'll get to see our associate pastor, Pastor Pat, as he leads the opening prayer. Before we get started today, I have a couple announcements to make. The first is that we're into the second week of our summer series, based on Max Lucado's book, Anxious for Nothing, Finding Calm in a Chaotic World. And today we'll be starting a conversation about what it means to celebrate God's sovereignty. So keep that in mind. I'd also remind you that we won't be taking an offering during this service, but if you would like to share a tithe with the church, you can send it to us in the mail, or you can drop it in our drop box on the alley side. We appreciate your ongoing support of our ministries. And one last thing to share is that there's a bit of a musical surprise in this service, so please stay tuned to see one of our greatest musical people giving some great musical gifts. And now as Joanna plays the prelude, I invite you to take a few moments to consider, what are you lamenting today and what are you celebrating? pleasure this morning to share the opening prayer with you. I invite you to use the opening prayer this morning as an opportunity to center yourselves in preparation for worship. Let us be in prayer together. Creator God, all creation is your handiwork. Your touch gives life to all that exists. You who shape and form us by the breath of your spirit and the touch of your grace, you alone are able to call forth from the depths of our being the beauty of your spirit in us. May we, in this time of worship and celebration, surrender more deeply to your loving touch as you fashion and form your heart's desire in each of us. This we pray in your spirit. Amen. I'd like to invite you to join uh, in the singing of the opening hymn.
for today. I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 17 verses 7 through 13 and this version comes from the message. But blessed is the man who trusts me, God, the woman who sticks with God. They're like trees replanted in Eden, putting down roots near the river. Never a worry through the hottest of summers, never dropping a leaf, serene and calm through droughts, bearing fresh fruit every season. The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. But I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I get to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. Like a cowbird that cheats by laying its eggs in another bird's nest is the person who gets rich by cheating. When the eggs hatch, the deceit is exposed. What a fool he'll look like then. From early on, your sanctuary was set high, a throne of glory exalted. O oh God, you are the hope of Israel. All who leave you end up as fools, deserters with nothing to show for their lives, who walk off from God, fountain of living waters, and wind up dead. The Word of Life. Thanks be to God.
started, I'd like to give a special welcome to Simpson United Methodist Church down in Pullman, who are joining us for the sermon portion of worship today. I enjoyed being in ministry with them for six years, and it is a joy to get to share a message with you today. So thanks for joining us, Simpson, and I hope that you can do so again in the near future. In my sermon last week, I shared with you all that I struggle with an anxiety disorder and that I've used a number of coping mechanisms over the years to deal with the overwhelming emotions that strike when I feel like my life is out of control. Say, because there's a pandemic going on and I had to reschedule my wedding, which was supposed to have been yesterday. If you're friends with me on Facebook, then you might have gotten a glimpse of one of the most productive ways in which I seek to create a sense of calm in my chaotic life. External order. If you aren't on Facebook or you didn't catch the clip, here it is real quick. It's glorious. Check out this pantry. Oh my gosh. It's so beautiful now. It's so orderly. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <sighs> happy one. This project has been on my to-do list for a very long time and has served as a constant sort of organizational consternation for years. After my plans for my first two days of vacation two weeks ago got a little waylaid with some unexpected gardening and painting projects, I took out my feelings of being out of control on my pantry. I pulled everything out, put it into categories, checked the expiration dates, of course, then headed to Target where I spent an embarrassingly large amount of money on baskets, as well as a couple of Lazy Susans, in order to eventually achieve what you saw in the video. Now, I don't share this glorious pantry of mine to flout my personal organizational skills or to brag about how much cans of soup I have, but rather to highlight the lengths that I will go to in order to bring a sense of order to the chaos of my life. I know I'm not the only one who is dealing with COVID-19 by distracting myself with some minor home improvement projects. Like me, many folks have used the unexpected free time that came with stay-at-home orders and no longer having to commute, not to mention the accompanying boredom and cabin fever, to clean out a few closets, improve the landscaping in their yard, or donate the detritus that is cluttering their lives to a worthy organization. While we might argue it's just because we had the time, as an experienced anxiety-inspired housekeeper, I know the truth. The last four months have felt very out of control for most of us. Anxiety breeds in any environment of chaos or disorder, whether perceived or real, and a global pandemic is a pretty acceptable reason for anyone to feel like no one, least of all me, is in control of the situation. So what are we to do when the world seems completely out of control and our anxiety is too? If cleaning out a cupboard can provide a moment's reprieve from the fear and anxiety, if a well-organized pantry can help us breathe a brief sigh of relief, and if a perfectly manicured lawn can give us a sense of order, however fleeting, What's the problem? Well, the problem is that despite all these desperate attempts at order, we're really no more in control of what's going on in our world just because we can finally park the car in the garage again. Take it from me. My anxiety disorder has persisted within me despite my best efforts to create order beyond me. Thanks to therapy, I'm learning that healing for anxiety requires that I properly consider who or what is ultimately in control of my life. No amount of outer organization done by me can address the inner healing that only God can bring, and Lord knows I have tried doing it on my own. Combined with the belief that God is the creator of all things, and that God names all things created as good, and that God desires good for all those good things, I'm learning that giving up control might just be the way to an anxiety-free existence. So what if I really allowed myself to believe that God is in control of my life? That God is sovereign over everything? That there's some sort of divine purpose for my existence and that God actually needs me to help accomplish some of his purposes in our world? That even though it seems like everything is going to hell in a handbasket, as they say, God knows that all will come together for good in the end. The Apostle Paul would say that adopting that kind of attitude a calm attitude would change everything. 
The series based on Max Lucado's book, Anxious for Nothing, Finding Calm in a Chaotic World, is built upon Paul's letter to the Philippians, and in particular the fourth part, chapter four, which we explored last week, where he suggested four strategies to beat anxiety brought on by problems in the world. Celebrate God's goodness. Ask God for help. Leave your concerns with God. Meditate on good things. Altogether, these four things create a convenient little acronym, CALM. Starting with today, we're going to spend three weeks on the C part of CALM, with a celebratory focus on Paul's directive to rejoice in the Lord, particularly in God's sovereignty, mercy, and to do so always. As I shared last week, Paul seems an unlikely person to suggest celebration as an antidote to anxiety, as he had a lot of reasons not to rejoice. In the course of his ministry up to the writing of this letter, he'd endured long days of travel on foot, multiple beatings, imprisonment, being put on trial, death threats, desertion by his closest friends, and if he'd known that his future held the promise of shipwreck, near starvation, and exile, he would know that rejoicing didn't really fit the situation. And yet, when writing to the Philippians about how to deal with the anxiety brought on by being a new church in a challenging world of change, it's exactly what Paul suggested. Instead of letting their anxiety at how out of control things seemed in Philippi to drive them to say, reorganize the church kitchen, Paul tells them to rejoice. God is in control. It's easy to dismiss this as some empty platitude, but Paul really believed that it was adopting this attitude toward the problems he faced that had made enduring them possible. It wasn't that saying God is in control removed all his problems, but that adopting an intentional mindset to trust in the sovereignty of God over his life in the midst of fear had a way of reframing the situation that made it more bearable. Consider the difference between saying, everything is a mess, nothing I will do will ever make it better, and everything is a mess, but God is ultimately in control and working for my good. Much better, right? So we can either rely on our own limited ability to control a situation beyond our control, or we can put our energy toward building trust in God by remembering that he has unlimited sovereignty over everything, including us. Turns out this isn't a novel idea. The Bible is full of people who figured out that finding stability in God was a much more effective way to weather the storms of life. People who made a conscious effort to increase their personal understanding of who God was as revealed through creation and everyday life. Books like Proverbs and Psalms, Lamentations, and the writings of the major and minor prophets are filled with beautiful images of God's sovereign presence in the tiniest details of our lives, while we're still in our mother's wombs, clothing the lilies of the field, and keeping his eye on the lowly sparrows. If people of faith can place their focus on God's divine power and presence in the midst of a world that's full of problems, the wise words of scripture teach us that we will find the calm we need to endure these trials and tribulations. Our scripture reading from Jeremiah today is one such example of someone who learned how to find calm in the sovereignty of God and sought to teach others how to do the same. Jeremiah was a career prophet in Judah during a very challenging time in the life of God's people. When he started his ministry, he spent his first years in the temple at Jerusalem, imploring people to return to God and stop worshiping other gods or turning away from the teachings of their faith. He could see the writing on the wall and knew that there were going to be some very hard times ahead. The Babylonian Empire was certain to conquer them, and he urged Judah to surrender to their enemy rather than be destroyed outright. They didn't listen, and in the end, Jerusalem was left a ruin and the temple along with it. Everyone lost their homes and were either taken into exile or fled as refugees. Jeremiah was a wreck. He was so devastated by the loss of the temple, the brokenness between God and the people, and the chaos of all of it, that he wept constantly and came to be known as the weeping prophet. He was so bereft, he wrote a whole book of lament about it. If you want to read something sad, turn to Lamentations, and you can experience the emotional pain the prophet endured during this season of his life. But he didn't give up. 
And he didn't try to fix it himself or reorganize his pantry for a brief reprieve. After getting his laments off his chest, Jeremiah turned control over to God and found relief from his anxiety in celebrating the sovereignty of God. So much relief that he was able to help his fellow exiles return to God and find their own calm in trusting their Lord once again. The scripture we read this morning is part of Jeremiah's effort to counsel the people of God to return to their sovereign, to deal with their new normal, life in exile. He gave them two options. Live like a parched shrub in the desert, desperately trying to survive on your own, or like trees replanted in Eden, putting down roots near the rivers, never a worry through the hottest of summers, never dropping a leaf, serene and calm through droughts, bearing fruit in every season. Option two was the right choice. What Jeremiah had come to understand from his own experience in finding wholeness in God, despite the world still swirling with chaos, is that the path to healing didn't begin out in the world, but inside one own heart, where God intimately knows us, and where God can work to heal the hurt done by a world that has betrayed our misplaced trust in it. That's really the rub of what Paul and Jeremiah are trying to get at. When faced with feeling out of control, too often, we turn to the world or our own abilities first, rather than leaning on God. And rarely does the world or our efforts do much more than exacerbate our fears. So how can we learn to lean on God more? Paul and Jeremiah would say by making an intentional decision to grow our trust in God. And to grow our trust in God, we have to learn more about who God is. And scripture, creation, and Christ are great places to start. We also have to take an honest look at ourselves and consider where we've been tending to turn when the four D's, as Lucado calls them, divorce, difficulties, disease, and death, strike. When the storms of life hit, where do we seek shelter, security, and comfort? Is our first instinct to turn to God, or have we for too long relied upon our own power or prowess? Have we turned too often to military might, technological innovations, political parties, or economic systems as our ultimate sources for finding control? Or have we gone to Target just one too many times to get way too many baskets? One of the harsh insights from the COVID-19 pandemic is that we have not relied on the things that can bring us the greatest security and calm. The things we have relied on have failed us which is why more people are dealing with anxiety in our nation and world than ever before. But it's also why we as people of faith have reason to celebrate because we know from scripture that there is another way to deal with our anxiety. A way that starts by proclaiming our belief in God and that God is in control of everything, even right now. And that no matter how out of control and insecure we feel, God is indeed at work in our world to bring about good for all people. If we rely upon the teachings of our faith, we can find comfort in the knowledge that the sovereignty of God means that when the whole world has turned upside down, we still have a safe place to turn, a place of true power, mercy, and grace that will sustain us through whatever challenges we face. If we can realign our hearts with that truth, the healing work that we so desperately need will begin and God can bring us to wholeness. So I have a little homework for you this week to help you grow in your trust of God and to work toward being anxious for nothing. Take a tip from the prophet and first write down your lamentations. What are you grieving? What feels out of control right now? What emotions are pent up inside and needing to get out? What have you tried to soothe your anxiety that only worked for a short time? Once you get it all out, and please take your time and use as much paper as you need. Remember, Jeremiah wrote a whole book. Put as much time and energy next into writing down your celebrations. What is giving you joy? Where do you see God at work? What are the signs that God is in control of your life and our world? How do you know you can trust God? When you've got it all down, and again, take all the time and paper you need, take a moment to rejoice that you have a sign that God is in control always and everywhere, especially in your life. Put your two lists somewhere easy to find and add to them as needed or revisit them when you need a reminder of how good God is. 
But your homework doesn't just stop there. You're sure to cross paths with someone this week and in the months to come who's dealing with anxiety and fear. And you have received just what they might need in order to find calm in the midst of the chaos. As Pastor Pat would say in a benediction, don't leave that here. Share what you have learned with others and spread the good news that God is in control of all lives and God intends good for all of us. Alleluia. Amen. when maybe we're running out of strength of our own. So let's take a moment and prepare our hearts and be in prayer together. Holy and gracious God, for many of us and for many reasons, it's been a long week. Frankly, the chaos and uncertainty doesn't feel like it's slowing down very much at all. And some of us feel like stress and anxiety are more and more our daily companions. So we come to you now, focusing our hearts and minds on you, asking that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, bringing refreshing, renewal, peace, and joy. We're reminded in your word and in our personal faith experience that you're true to your promises and that you'll ease the burdens of loss, unknowing, grief, sickness, and pain that we cannot carry by ourselves. And we know this because too often we try to carry it by ourselves. You remind us that you will refresh us and give us rest if we call on you. So here we are, right now, humble and confessing that we need you like never before. We come today seeking forgiveness for the too many times we have chosen our own paths and guided our own journeys. Forgive us for letting fear and worry control our minds and for allowing pride and selfishness to interfere with our lives and our relationships. Forgive us for not trusting you and following your word more closely. We also come to you today to thank you, something we too often forget to do. So thank you for being close to us, especially the sick, the lost, the lonely. And we thank you for hearing our prayers and for knowing our hearts. We thank you for your ongoing presence in our lives, whispering that no matter what we're facing, your heart and your ears are open to our prayers. Now I'd like to pause for just a moment to let you lift up your own individual prayer concerns for the people and the situations around the world that you feel the need to talk to God about. Feel free to hit the pause button and take as much time as you need. We'll be right back when you come back. Holy One, help us, we pray, to not take for granted the gift of love you have offered on our behalf and for all that Christ has done for each of us. We ask that you would keep our steps firmly on solid ground, 
helping us to be faithful and not distracted by things of the world that could call us away from a closer walk with you. Shine your light in us and through us and over us, that others might see you working even through the likes of us, making a difference in the world for your glory, so that those looking for you this day might find you through us and through our church. May we reflect your peace and hope to a troubled world that so desperately needs both right now. And now we offer to you the prayer that your son taught us some 2,000 years gone by, beginning, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as, as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses. trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we'd like to thank you for being an ongoing and important part of our ministry of prayer. And now I invite you to join John in singing our closing hymn, Blessed Be Your Name. Good God, 
who holds us in our anxiety and distress, and who has a plan for our future. Amen.